introduce the next speaker, speaker Professor Gabriel Navarro from Valencia, my most frequent collaborator, actually. So this uh, area is the American theory, and the theory of finite groups. He's written several books on that. One of them is about to come out, right? Yes, right. <coughs> and uh, he will give a course on characters of finite groups and chains of PISA groups. Okay, thanks a lot, Gunther. I was thinking on changing the routine about, I would like to thank the speaker, the organizers for giving me this opportunity, for giving me a lot of work. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but I really am very happy to be here and to have prepared this course. So I, I'm not aiming at my uh, brilliant colleagues, I'm aiming to the students. So, okay, I just said that. Uh, first time that I was here, I was 1990. I met several of you here. And the organizers were no less than, than John Alperin, Charles Curris, Walter Feit, and Paul Funk. And they announced his, uh, his conjecture that I'm going to talk about uh, probably the third day. So it's difficult to keep up the standards, I think. <laughs> but we will try. And the second time it was 2008. And while I was talking about counting characters, something that, that I'm also I'm going to talk about, my son at school was being lectured on character counts, about <laughs> personality. <laughs> so I thought that this was amazing. And this is, this is recorded in the 2008 lecture. And the third time was uh, part of this program. I gave the, with Marty Isaacs, we gave the summer school and I see some faces that attended at the school, so I guess this is a good sign. And this is my fourth time. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, chains of PISA groups, but more generally, this is, G is going to be final group. And P is going to be a prime. I don't think it can get better than this. <laughs> the finite group via prime. And one of the main problems in representation theory well, I want to I R, R of G is going to be the set of irreducible characters. You know that every representation has a trace. Characters are the traces, and the character chi is irreducible. These are the characters, and the character is irreducible if and only if it's not the sum of two characters, okay? So I define what irreducible character is. So one of the main problems is to count certain characters or characters, well, reducible characters of G. P locally. This is a vague term, but what I mean by local, what we usually mean by local, this was a term that, that was coined by John Alperin, I think. It's about, uh, so we say that, that the local, local subgroups, or P-local, I'm going to forget about P immediately. So the P-local subgroups are normalizers of P subgroups. P, a P subgroup of G. And of course, I mean, we don't want this to be G, right? Because G is not local, G is global. So probably, I mean, our groups more interesting are the ones with OP of G. This is the largest normal subgroup, the radical, the unipotent radical that we're talking about. So we are going to assume in almost cases that, that OP of G is one. But as I'm saying, this is a vague notation because sometimes, I mean, I would, I can't, I can't say that, that the centralizer of a P element 
I would consider this local too. Or I can consider local intersections of local subgroups or even P subgroups. So local is a vague, uh, uh, has a, uh, is a vague concept that it's related with uh, the, the intersection, P subgroups, etc. But I will make this more precise. Okay, so this is the main problem: how to count how to count irreducible characters P locally. How can we do that? Okay, as we all know, if I mean if k is an irreducible character, then we know by using some little algebraic uh, number theory, but we know that k of one, the degree, is a divisor of the order of the group, and it makes sense to divide the characters according to the p part. So, for me. Uh, this, this is the largest power of p that divides this number. So this is a p part. So for instance, I say that chi has p prime degree. Oh. If the p part equals one, this means that p doesn't divide. And there is another, in the other extreme, and this is what I'm mainly going to talk about, they are the defect zero, P defect zero characters. So I'm gonna talk today about P defect zero characters. So what is this? These were introduced by Richard Brower, and they are key and fundamental in the representation theory. So I'm going to say that, that chi, an irreducible character of G, has defect zero or P defect zero. If the P part is as large as possible. Okay, these are called the P defect zero characters. And if you run out of problems, there is a, a, a collection of, of celebrated list by Richard Brower. And I think it was problem, I'm, I'm going to quote Brower. So he said, problem 19. I have to at least write once in the blackboard his name, Richard Brower. Problem 19 is characterize by group theoretical uh, methods of characterized group theoretically, the number of PDF zero characters of G. <clears throat> In this series of lectures, I'm going to call this number K naught of G. This number, this number is K naught of G. Number of defect zero characters of G. P is already forgotten, so there is always a P which is fixed. Okay, why P defect zero characters are so important? I'm going to write down a theorem of Richard Brower. I don't expect you to understand every single uh, part of it, but you will see soon how, why this theorem is so important. For instance, in the, uh, Radha Kessler is going to lecture on blocks. Last week you heard about defect groups. Believe me, this is an important theorem. So this is just to introduce the importance of defect zero characters. So this theorem is a theorem of Brouwer. And it says the following, G is a finite group and Q is a P subgroup. So suppose that Q is a P subgroup of G. Then Q is 
I will explain later a little bit, a DFA group. of some block, I'll explain later, B of G, if and only if there exists an irreducible character theta of Q times the centralizer of Q having Q in its kernel of PD fixed zero. Such that the following happens. We have a P subgroup here, Q. We have the elements that centralize Q. This is of course the center of the P subgroup. Let me call it C. So this is QC, all these leaves in the normalizer in G of Q. So we have this nice picture, very local picture, everything is piece groups. And say there's a character that lives here. You know that the group X, I mean this, this group is normal. So this group X conjugating the characters and it's always important to take the stabilizer. This is the stabilizer. So, such that this quotient is P prime. It's not divisible by P. If you want to find different groups in the computer using GAP, for instance, this is the way. Just go, try to find all P subgroups, try to find defect zero characters, calculate the stabilizer, and whenever you hit with someone that is not divisible by P, you have a defect group. But it's much more than this, okay? And the, the story is that, in fact, the number of pairs of conjugacy classes of pairs Q theta is the number of P blocks of G. In fact, <coughs> theta uniquely determines, uniquely determines this P block. Do not panic because I'm going to explain a little bit. This is just to show you the importance. I'm not going to use any of this. But now, let me explain a little bit why this is important. Okay, we were, for me, R is going to be the ring of algebraic integers. And I'm going to take a M to be a maximal ideal of R containing my prime P. And I'm going to let F, this is a very useful field in representation theory, R over M, which is one of Meinolf's uh, fields, this is the algebraic closure, isomorphic to algebraic, algebraic closure of the field of P elements. This is a, a field of characteristic P. And now you can do, you can consider the group algebra. You can decompose the group algebra as sum of two-sided in the composable ideals. And these are the P blocks.
So what is the number T? The number T is the number of G conjugacy classes of pairs of P defect zero characters of this form. So this ring theoretical thing that you're going to see in, the, in, in some of the courses here can be determined by these P defect zero characters. That's just one tiny example of the importance of defect zero characters. Much more than that, I cannot resist telling you this, is that, well, if you believe that theorem of Brouwer, then this guy, I mean, this pair, if you read that theorem for the normalizer of Q, it determines a block B of the normalizer of Q, but also determines a block B of G. This is an algebra. And this is an algebra. If you are more into algebras, another of the main problems in representation theory is to find the exact relationship between these two algebras. For instance, Bruce conjecture says that the module category, if Q is abelian, but his conjecture is only for pure abelian, then the module category of these two algebras are derived equivalent. Okay, this is just to explain why defect zero characters are so important, and you will see more examples. Okay, so this number is important in finite groups. <clears throat> By the way, if you come back again, all this is local except in the case where Q is one. So what is this saying if Q is one? Well, Q is one, the centralizer is G, so this is just a defect zero character. So defect zero characters of G are not local, whatever that means, okay? Good. <clears throat> I'm going to use today several times this field. And there are some tricks with this field which are very nice. I'm going to call a star just the, the projection, the ring homomorphism. So R goes to R star, which is R plus M. Okay, more about defect zero characters. They have wonderful properties. Let me start by defining this. Suppose that you have a, a character chi. L let me call it pretty simple. Then we know that the values, this is just elementary linear algebra. You go to the representation and you do elementary linear algebra. You know that it is sum of roots of unity. So this is really an algebraic integer. But there is a much more important algebraic integer in ordinary character theory and modular representation theory, which is the following. And this is not so difficult. It's, it's quite elementary to prove this. Is the following. Whenever you have an element G and G, and you consider the conjugacy class of G, then this number is an algebraic integer. So I can start it, okay, because it's clear. In fact, these are the, I mean, this defines algebra, homomorphisms, etc. I don't need any of this right now. But in any case, if you have a character, you can always start your character. So what is a star my character? Well, if I start my character, this is simply a class function, I mean, for every G, this is chi of G star. So this is a class function of G, but this time over F. Okay? I have an exercise and a conjecture. For instance, if chi is any character, well, let's say reducible character of G, 
and G sub P group. The exercises show that chi star is always zero. Okay, this is easy. Hint, here there are few P power roots of unity because the characteristic of F is P, meaning that you can prove that chi of G, this is in general, is congruent with chi of one modulo P. So when I was preparing these lectures, okay, uh, I realized, I mean, I have to confess something. I mean, I, I play a lot with the computer. So this is a confession. So I realized this can be a conjecture or just an observation that if P is odd and this G is simple, I couldn't find any example. So I would say that chi star is always not zero. What, what, what? Not zero. Uh, say, say it again. Chi star is just the dimension. So you want it to be nonlinear. Oh, that is for sure, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I want key RP. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, I noticed this thing, and this is a commentary for the experts. It seems that the decomposition numbers, at least with a computer, you cannot have characters and simple groups such that the decomposition numbers are all divisible by P for P out. Or perhaps my code was wrong, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, so now let me prove the following theorem. I'm gonna be proving theorems, just. So this is my first theorem. If G is a finite group, and chi one, chi s are irreducible characters of G with P defect zero of P defect zero. Then I'm going to prove that the stars are F linear independent. Proof for the experts. You know that this is our irreducible power characters, but we are not talking here. I mean, we want something at the lowest possible level. So, how do you prove that in an elementary way? Let me see if I remember. So, suppose that I suppose that I yeah suppose that I have a, a linear combination. equal zero, where the ri's are in r, and I want that the coefficients are zero. So I make, I consider this character, C, well not a character, sorry, just a linear combination of, r linear combination of characters. And I'm going to do this trick, if I remember correctly. I multiply G, I, I'm going to do this product. Okay, I never talked about the inner product, but as you all know, but it's my, I mean, it's my duty to recall every single thing that I'm going to use. Whenever you have Two characters, well, two characters in a group. My notation is alpha beta, the inner product, is one divided by G, sum over the classes, sum over the, well, the elements of alpha x, beta x conjugate. Sometimes I use this, or sometimes I use, since uh, characters are class function, I can also use this. I can run over the conjugacy classes, and I just have to do this. I mean, I pick, a, I pick up a representative, and I do this. These are just an element in the conjugacy class, 
because these characters are trace functions, so this is okay. And as you know, the irreducible characters, alpha, if these are irreducible characters, alpha with alpha is one and alpha with beta is zero. Orthogonality relations. Okay, so let's come back to this thing. This is an integer and this is an integer because I'm doing the product, well, this is not, this is not an integer, but it is an element, well, the, this guy is rj. So this is an integer and this is an algebraic integer, so I can start it, okay? Integer and algebraic integer, I can start it. And what is this? Okay, this is just size of g, chi j of one, one divided by g, sum over the classes of c of an element, and chi j x k bar k, and that's it. Okay, and now I have to start the whole thing. Now I can erase this. <coughs> and what is this? Okay, the G cancel, and I'm gonna move, I'm going to move this guy over here, and what I'm going to have is C of XK, size of K, chi J X K inverse if I want, divided by chi of J of one, star. And now it comes the good moment in the proof that these guys are, this, this is in R, but this is also in R, remember? This is somewhere here, this is in R. So I can start everything. So this is the sum, K, C, K, star, and this star. But I know that C star, by my assumption, is to put the stars in everything, we are assuming that, that this sum is zero, so this is zero. Right? This is my hypothesis. I'm, I have a linear combination of the stars, which is zero. But now, here comes the, the nice part. So this is zero. But this is not zero because but here, here we have, I mean, both of these guys are integers. The left-hand side is this thing. And this is a p-defect zero character. So this means that the p is the, the p part of this guy is taking all the p parts. This is, this is a p prime number, so this, the star is not zero. So this should be zero. So this implies that rj star is zero as we want it. Okay, so linear independent, uh, p defect zero characters over f are really linear independent. Okay, what is this good for? Let me show you another trick. I'm trying to understand Brouwer's problem number 19. How many defect zero characters are in a group? Can you give a, a group theoretical description of that? Okay, here's another trick. The exercise was part A. Part B was for my colleagues. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so another trick. Okay, let's see if I remember correctly. Yes, suppose that chi, this is uh, observation. Suppose that chi is an irreducible character of G with P defect zero. And suppose that G is an element of G. And suppose that chi of G star is not zero. Let's see what happens. Right? Okay, the trick now is to do this, which I'm gonna do it. Let K to be the conjugacy class of little g, and I do this product. Size of g divided by the size of K, this is an integer. And I multiply by my favorite algebraic integer, which is size of K, chi of g, divided by chi of one. So this is integer times algebraic integer, so it's an algebraic integer. So I can start this guy, and I can put things together. Okay, this is, 
you cannot always put things together. You've got to, to put things together when you can. Okay, but now if I put things together, what I realize is that this is just the size of G divided by chi of one, chi of G star. I just canceled the case. And what is this? This is again size of G divided by chi of one star chi G star. And my hypothesis is that this is not zero. So this is not zero. And this is PDFX zero character, which again, this means that this number is not divisible by P because the P part has taken all the P, all the P part of G. Oh, so this is not zero. But wait, wait a second. This means that this number here cannot be zero, right? I can, I mean, this, the star of these guys is the product of the stars. So the conclusion here is the conclusion, well, I'm gonna do the conclusion here. So the conclusion here is that this number a star is not zero. This is my conclusion. But this means what this, this means that the p part of this uh, number is the p part of this one because this means that p doesn't divide this guy. So this means that the p part of k is the p part of g. And this is so nice because whenever you have a character with p defect zero, which means if you have a character whose p part is the largest power of p dividing the order of the group, you have a class in which the same happens. Okay, so this means that, well, you can say that in this case, the conclusion is that uh, the, this is the size of the class, so this is the full p part. So this means that this guy is p, that this number is p prime. It's not divisible by p. So this means that p doesn't divide. Okay, so these are called P defect zero classes. So these are called P defect zero classes. And what I have proved is that if chi has a P defect zero character, G has a P defect zero class. So remember that there is this famous problem by Richard Brower. So how many, so how many, uh, P defect zero characters are. Okay, it's a famous problem also because it's a difficult one. The answer is not the number of P defect zero classes. Example, okay, I, I saw an example. Perhaps there, I'm sure there are easy ones. But let me, so. I mean, it's, it's a nice guess because in how many irreducible characters are there? The number of conjugacy classes. We, we have this, we have this uh, parallelism between conjugacy classes and characters, so you want to, to go as far as possible. But sometimes it's too far. So, for instance, if G is A5 and P equals two, the character degrees of A5, if I remember correctly, is one, three, three, four, and five. The size of G is 60, which is four times 15. So four is the largest power of, of two dividing G. So this guy is a defect zero character. Okay, so G has one defect zero character, but the classes of the three cycles and the two classes of five cycles the, the centralized of the three cycles, the three cycle, the centralized of the five cycles are five cycles. These are defect zero classes. So there are three of them. So one is less than or equal to three. So you do not expect equality. So in order to solve problem 19, uh, that was too easy. So what is the solution to problem 19 and why it's important? Well, we are going to see that that some invariant that's, that the rest of the characters, this is the main part of this series of, of talks, is really local, but not the defect zero characters. The defect zero characters have a different count, have a different nature, but it's solved. So you can forget about defect zero characters. So what is the solution of this problem? The solution of this problem was given by, by Jeff Robinson. So the solution is Jeff Robinson. Yeah, uh, problem 19. Characterized by group, well, group theoretically, 
the number of PDPX0 characters of G. Okay, and the answer is group theoretically, group theoretical, and this is the answer. Okay, so we are uh, what Jeff Robinson, so this is a theorem of Robinson. What he did is suppose that K and L are PDPX0 classes. And he considered, he cooked up a number, and suppose that P, oh well, of G, and suppose that P is a silo P subgroup of G. So consider this number. Omega KL is the number. This is very group theoretical. We use this kind of tricks a lot. Take the number of pairs of conjugacy of elements in K and L such that Px equals Py. There is a reason why to consider this thing. I will, I will not explain that. This is, this is really modular representation theory. But okay, consider this. And notice that P acts on omega KL by conjugation. Of course, I mean, if you if you conjugate by an element of, of P, X to the Z is in the, in the conjugacy class K and the same with Y, okay? And notice that P doesn't fix anything. I mean, if X, Y, if Z is an element of P and it's fixed, that would be, this means that X, for instance, that X, Z equals X. So this means that Z belongs to the centralizer of X and we know that these are PDF0 characters, a classes. So this means this is a P prime group. P doesn't divide this group. This is a P prime group. So this means that Z should be one. Okay, so P acts, uh, what is the, uh, no, it's regularly or something like that, without fixed points. Regularly. Okay, so this means, what, what's the Okay, sorry, <laughs> okay. So this means that omega KL, the size is divisible by P, right? Because P is permuting things without fixing anything and every orbit has size uh, the, the order of P. So Jeff considered this modulo P and he created a matrix A. So his theorem was, this is Robinson, that K0 of G is the rank of the matrix. Okay, that's the answer. Is this the answer to Brouwer's problem? It is, this is group theory. I mean, if you know the group G, you can compute these numbers. You compute, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Theoretically, you can compute a number. <laughs> well, I mean, you can compute a number. You have a big computer, you can do it. And then you do the rank of this matrix, and this is the number of defect zero characters. So defect zero characters, and this was the first, my first point in this series of lecture, have a different nature. They are not local, they are not. But the rest, we are going to prove that they are local. That's what we are aiming. Okay, I want to talk about another consequence that I will use of defect zero characters. This is the famous Brouwer Nesbitt theorem. This is a theorem. Yes. Excuse me? PX and PY. PX? Cosets? No, cosets, cosets. Oh, cosets. Cosets, yes, cosets. <clears throat> so, this is a theorem of Brown and Hesbit, which I will use.
Brower proved everything. Some of, the, oh, some of these results, not, not Robinson's of course, but some of these results were proved by Brower using modular representational theory. But in some cases, with using uh, cleverly the field F, you can avoid using all the, all the background that you need to, to do represent, modular representational theory. And this was proven, this theorem, this very nice theorem was proven by, by Brower and Nesbitt using modular representation theory, but I will comment on several proofs. So the theorem says that chi, so suppose that chi is a reducible character, and suppose that it has p defect zero. Again, suppose that it has p defect zero, then what they prove is then chi of g equals zero, for all G in G, such that P divides the order of G. This is an amazing theorem telling you that whenever you have a P defect zero character, in the character table, many of the entries are zero. In fact, I, I, you can write it as an if and only if, but this is the, the hard part. In fact, <coughs> Excuse me? Oh, the order of the element. O of G is the order of, of G. In fact, you can, in fact, it's an if and only if in the sense that the following are equivalent. Suppose, uh, yeah, chi has p defect zero. chi of g equals zero for all g in g of order divisible by p. Chi of g equals zero for every non-trivial element in a silo Pisa group. These things are equivalent. Let me show you how beautiful it is to prove this. I mean, of course, well, if you put a, b, c, of course, B implies C. Let me show you how C implies A, which is very easy. And because I'm going to use the regular characters several times. <clears throat> For every finite group, let me call it now P, you have a famous character, which is, of course, the regular character. Okay. This is a character that has the values are the size of the group or zero. This is called, if I sometimes refer to this character, I will say that this is the regular character. And of course, if, if you are trying to prove that C implies A, this is easy. Because what you do is, if you know that a character is zero on a silo, then you restrict down to the silo Pisa group. Oh, so it's always zero. So it's always zero means that it's a rational multiple of the regular character. Yeah, because I mean, it's always zero. These characters differ only in the in the in the identity. So it's a multiple of one in one another, and this is implies. I mean, if you do, uh, yeah. Yeah, this means that a, you say a has to be an integer, you prove that, and then the size of p divides chi of one. Because this is, a, this is a character. So the, the a has to be uh, an algebraic integer and the rational, so it has to be, it's easy to prove that it's, it's that p divides the, the size of one, of the degree. Okay, I wanted to, to do something before finishing. <clears throat> yes, I mean, I, I was hurrying because I wanted to tell you about a wonderful theorem here. Okay, so this is uh, about the proof. Yes, exactly. Okay, first of all, this was proved by Brower and Nesbitt used modular representation theory. This was proved by Gallagher. using Brower's characterization of characters. So modular representation theory is here. 
Brower's uh, characterization of characters still is high. I mean, now in the book of Marty, you can find a proof of Brower's characterization of characters in three pages, but they are very clever. I mean, you don't consider this elementary character theory. Brower's, this was a conjecture. So, I mean, the time has gone by, but still it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful theory. So Gallagher proved by using Brower characterization of characters, and now there is a more recent proof by, oh, my nerve. sorry about that. <clears throat> I think it's Leitz, Leitz. I'm sorry I missed, it. anyway. So now there is a proof by mine, Manfred Leitz, I think it's elementary character, elementary character theory. which I have put it in my book, I have to sell it. <laughs> and finally, I wanted to, to add here something very, 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 very nice, which is a theorem of Knorr, one of my favorite theorems in character theory that says that it's enough that chi of g is zero if p divides, if order of g is zero, if order of g is p. So it's enough to know that on the elements of order P, the character vanishes. I have another one, which is mine, but I'm not going to go into that. Okay. And Knorr's theorem uses modular, not very deep modular representation theory, but it uses modular representation theory. But I have to, I have to say it because I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of this, and it's not mine that John Murray gave me a very, very nice proof of this fact just by using the field F and a couple of nice tricks. I was so tempted to give you the proof here, but I have to move on to, to the real subject. Okay, so this was just a little bit of a digression, digression. but I want to, to say something about uh, something that I will use uh, in the next lecture, which is the following theorem. Another group theoretical consequence is suppose that you have a finite group G and you have a character of defect zero. Then OP of G is one. So you don't have a unipotent radical. So proof. Remember that OP of G is simply a normal subgroup of G of, yeah, of order prime power. So let me give you a proof. I had a more complicated proof, but this is from Martis. And also this allows me just to remind you a little bit about character theory. So the part of in this week, I mean, I will use some of the classical theorems of characters. So I just said before that defect zero characters vanishes on elements of order P. So this means that chi L, the same trick, is a multiple of the regular character because chi of the elements in L are zero for every L in L not equal to one. So this means that it's a multiple of the regular character. But this means that the one is showing up there. So re remember regular character is the sum of all the characters. So this means that in particular, the one is showing up there. So this means that chi L, one L is not zero because it's there, right? The regular character contains all the characters. So this means that one is here, so one is in the restriction. But now there is something called the, uh, the Clifford. So this is an excuse to write Clifford's theorem. That says that when you restrict to a character, to a normal subgroup, you get, you pick up 
one character and all the conjugates. But if one character is one, this is G-stable, so it's a multiple of 1L, right? This is Clifford's theorem. Clifford's theorem tells you that, that chi of zero to L is a sum of G conjugates of one irreducible character. But if you know that one of L is there, then you have this thing. But remember that chi of G was zero for every element in G, in L, for instance, not one. And now I'm saying something which is the opposite. I mean, not the opposite, but it's, it's impossible. So all this together means that L equals one. Okay, so for instance, and with this I am finishing, and this is what I will use in order to announce or to talk about the Alperin wave conjecture, which is next week, next uh, class, or next talk. <clears throat> Suppose, so this is a little lemma, Suppose that chi is an irreducible character of the normalizer of G of Q over Q, which has perfect zero character. This is called a P weight. If you have heard about Alperin's weight conjecture, it's a weight. So if you have a weight, then uh, Q equals OP of the normalizer in G of Q. But this is clear because I proved right now that this group has a defect zero character. So what is OP? So this means that OP of the group equals one. But if this is OP of the normalizer, if this guy is OP of the normalizer in G of Q, that would be a normal subgroup of order of power of P, but there is no, so this means that L should be Q. These kind of P subgroups are very important in representation theory. They are called the P radical subgroups. So Q is set, Q is P radical subgroup of G. And right now, I don't remember who invented this notation, perhaps Alperin, I'm not sure. And I think I'm going to stop here. <clears throat> I guess there are no questions. Okay. What? If I can. No, there is. Oh, that that gives me an opportunity. And this was not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> it was not prepared, but this gives me an opportunity that it is not a problem. It's listed in the list. There is another famous list by Walter Feit about problems in representation theory in his book. He says about the existence. Can you give a group theoretical, uh, just not how many, Brouwer asks how many are there, defect zero characters, and, and Feit uh, only mentioned, uh, only, he, he only wanted to say when there is at least one. So this is uh, Tiep's question, when the rank is not zero, uh, I don't know if there is an answer for this by looking at this matrix, but there is a very nice theorem of Strunkov. So this is a theorem of Strunkov. I hope I remember it correctly. It's kind of funny. It says that G has a PDFX0 character. If and only if, the number, what is, this? what is this? Yeah, the number. Yes, if there exists some G, oh, this, this, is, this is very nice. And very funny too. It's just one, one line. So if there exists a G such that, and some people, has, some people in the audience have worked on these things, which are, yeah, you take how many pairs 
A and B in G cross G, such that the commutator is G. So there are some numbers, okay? So there is a defect zero character if and only there is a G such that P doesn't divide this number. <coughs> this is a theorem. This is a, f it's, it's an amazing theorem, how you can relate existence of defect zero characters with computators and pairs and everything. But this is a theorem. And it's not, it's not very difficult. It, it used some modular representation theory, but I also have avoided it. So it's, it's, it's ordinary representation theory using the trick of the field F. Yeah, no, no, yeah. What you're saying is it's known that it's not, that there could be no local formula that this defects your... I would be... My the way I see this problem is that defects zero characters is a, is a global problem. For instance, imagine that G is a P prime group. Every character has P defects zero characters, so it's, uncount it's uncountable locally. So the main, the main thing of today, I think, is that defects zero characters have their own nature, and from now on, we are going to not forget because we are going to use them, but they are a different type of characters. What we are going to to conjecture, which is this conjecture, is that the rest, how many of them are not of defect zero? Well, this is in fact Alperin's way conjecture, this is local, whatever that means. 